So it's March 23rd, 2015. Um, we're here with Phil Wenger. Um, I'm Michelle Metcalf. I'm with the Central Pennsylvania Oral History Project. Um, do you do we have your permission to get your story for the project? We do. That's great. Um, so the materials will be preserved in the archives from the LGBT Center and also in Dickinson College. Um, it may be disseminated in later um, publications and on the internet, so I just wanted to be very clear with where it's going. But um, thank you, we're really excited. So the purposes of this is primarily for research, or you could actually make a full-length movie someday, or you could like... Uh if I ran for president, this would be <laughs> access to all the press, to be able to uh, have access to this, is that right? All of the above, and we're also just trying to redocument a history that's been very overlooked um, and, I mean, completely ignored in some senses, so mm -hmm. um, we're trying to reclaim that. Um, okay, so can you tell me a little bit about your family life and your early development? Okay. Yeah, I uh, am the son of a preacher and a teacher. Uh, I was born in Africa, in the country of Ethiopia. So my parents were missionaries. They went in in 1949, and then they came back in 1970, and I would have been like 12 years old when we came back from Africa. So I'm a s number seven of eight children. I have four sisters and three brothers, so that makes eight of us in all. And I'm number seven, so I have one younger brother. Uh, when I was young, I went to boarding school because my parents were out in the mission field, and then uh, when, by the time I got into fifth grade, then I came back here to the United States. I uh, settled in Lancaster County and ended up going to basically Mennonite schools. So I graduated from Lancaster Mennonite High School and then ended up going to Eastern Mennonite University. Uh, I, I took like eight years to graduate from college. I kept dropping out every time I... You know, get another student loan, I'd take off, and then I'd come back and figure out what my major was going to be. Uh, so from a development point of view, that's, that was the context of which I was raised. Uh, it was a very faith-based family. We weren't fundamentalist at all, but we were very uh, focused on education as being critical, social justice as being important, and uh, sort of a giving back to the community uh, was the, that, that sort of family social dynamic that I was raised with. And, uh, yeah, that was, uh, I would say my family rarely represented my faith because we were such a close unit. Because we grew up in Africa, we were, you know, really close. And uh, that was the context in which I was raised. Okay. Um, what is your connection to the LGBT community in Central Pennsylvania? Well, you... Uh, you're going to ask me a coming out story at a later point because I could sort of walk my way through that or I could just talk right that, now. You can do that now if you'd like. Well, right now, I mean, my connection to the LGBT community centers, I support them financially. I've been active on a number of boards and precursors to the LGBT community center. I was one of the founders of the Langster AIDS Project when HIV first swept through this community and we started that organization. And I've been an independent mm -hmm. business person, so I was able to come out fairly early for what was early in those days. And you know, today all the transgender youth are coming out when they're like five years old. But uh, for us, coming out in your early 20s was considered uh, sort of the thing you did. And so ever since I was in my early 20s, I've been socially active around LGBT rights, involved in numerous uh, organizations and uh, participating in numerous activities from organizing Pride Days to um, fundraising banquets in the early days of uh, the LGBT Community Center. Okay. Um, so, can we uh, get your occupational history a little bit then? I've always been an entrepreneur. In fact, I want my grand, I want my tombstone to say he likes to make things grow. So every time I get involved in organizations, I get a uh, certain energy that I bring to them and I like to make them grow. So. Uh, because of that, I never was really good working for somebody else in this little box that, you know, everybody tells you what to do and then you do it and that's life. I wanted to be in control of my own destiny. So I've always basically been self-employed. Uh, I did sales in college and I worked in a number of different sort of places. But by the time I got out of college, I knew I wanted to just run my own business. So with a buddy, I, uh, well, there were a number of businesses I tried. I tried Sawdust, etc., which was a... a 
a little construction company with a couple friends and we renovated some houses and then I didn't like that model of business so then we started a city garden co-op because I took a couple years to live in Washington DC and we brought food into a lot of the poor neighborhoods and tried to get them to eat healthier you know that kind of thing and then uh, I wandered around until a buddy of mine by the name of Isaac said let's open a restaurant so I got started then uh, with Isaac's and uh, we started a little company in downtown Lancaster. It was a 40 seat restaurant and that restaurant uh, was very popular. Except Isaac, who was the only other gay guy I knew from college, he and I were not compatible as business friends. And 60 days after we started this restaurant, he said, I'm out of here. And he went to Alaska. And so now I have a restaurant. I don't really know what I'm doing in a restaurant, but it was the business then that I chose to build. So then the next, uh, oh, I don't know, 30 years, I just built more Isaacs. So today it's a chain of restaurants. Uh, we're 18 restaurants today in about seven counties. And so I'm basically a, an entrepreneur and uh, running that company. Um, Restaurants, though, were generally motivated by uh, money and, you know, making money. I was always motivated by community activities. And so for me, the thing that made me the most proud was the fact that that gave me a stage to do the community building activities that I really enjoyed. So I have a whole lit list of professional things that I've done. Chaired the Lancaster Chamber of Commerce, chaired the Community Foundation, redirected a lot of money, um, chaired the Lancaster County Coalition to End Homelessness, in the early days, uh, you know, Planned Parenthood was really where I cut my teeth. Uh, but prior to that, I'm counting backwards, then was the Lancaster Age Project. And we basically started that when I was about 25. About 1985 or so, HIV was just coming to the forefront. They didn't know what it was. It was an early gay cancer. We had some friends who were infected. And, you know, all of a sudden people were dying by the late 80s. And we needed to respond as a community, so I got really involved with that. So the restaurants are my occupation, but community building is what really feeds my soul and, and what I really enjoy. Okay. Um, so can you tell me your coming out story? <laughs> 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 well, you know, I went to boarding school and I came back to this country and I basically was probably socially as inept as you can imagine. I mean, I just really didn't have a real sense of, of who I was sexually or, or whether I should be dating girls or whether I was attracted to boys. And none of that really gelled until I had been back in the United States for a few years. And that's because our United States culture is so driven by the music you listen to, by the kind of kids you hang out with and how you get labeled. And when I came back here, I had grown up in an environment where there was no television. There was no uh, like fitting into a certain subset of American culture, I had to figure out how the American culture worked first. So the sexuality part came much later. So uh, I, I sort of knew I was always different. I mean, if you look at my high school graduation parent pictures, you know, I, I wore the big stupid tie and I had enjoyed fooling around with other people and laughing and having a blast. But I was. Uh, just not quite cut out of the same cloth as everybody else, but the self-awareness really took root in the high, in the year after graduation from high school. And uh, I was in the drugstore, I picked up a novel, it's called The Front Runner, it's a love story between a runner and his coach, and I had been a runner in high school, and that story just devastated me. So I read a novel, and next thing you know, I'm bawling like a baby because it's a love story between two guys that I had never really even put that box over my, you know, attractions prior to that. And I realized, oh my God, I must be gay. And I was like, you know, 17 years old, 18 years old. So that was basically my coming, my self-awareness. Then it probably fast forward three years until you actually are aware to admit that to other people. So that was a series of steps in my college experience then that led me to where I was able to publicly identify as being gay. First was probably, I, uh, I, I was an English major, I was interested in studying journalism, so I went to University of Maryland for a year and came back and was selected to edit our college newspaper uh, when I was like uh, 19. And so I was editing our college newspaper in a Christian college where there were no gay people. I mean, we just didn't talk about it. There was just, that wasn't even on the radar screen uh, in 1978. And so, uh, as the editor, I wanted to stir the pot. And so I uh, 
wrote an anonymous letter to the editor about being a gay person. And he stood it at Eastern Manhattan University where this wasn't even talked about. It wasn't socially accepted. It wasn't biblically blessed. There was no way that it would do. And I wrote that anonymously. And that was a real ethical dilemma because you shouldn't, as the editor of the paper, be planting a story. And that's exactly what I did. But I confessed it later to my staff and I confessed it later to others that it was really me that was writing that letter and I did identify with it later. So that was sort of the beginning of my coming out and then I dropped out of college again, went to Washington DC and this is in the days when if you were young, you were in your 20s, and you were sexually active, there was bars that had already opened up. So whether we went to the Rehoboth and went to the Boathouse or whether I'd come home to Lancaster and we had the Tally Ho which has been open since like 1970. I mean these gay bars had started so you, then you began to make friendships and you began to self-identify as gay. And then there was the coming out to your parents. And for me, my father always said, it's not what you believe, but it's how you take what you learn and apply it into a set of beliefs that work for you. So I'm not going to tell you that you have to have a rigid set of values of which you must operate your life, but as long as you know how to think and as long as you know how to process, you'll end up being fine. So, because my father was as different from his father on issues like music instruments in the home, uh, whether or not you wear plain clothing, you know, the Mennonites and Amish always separated themselves by clothes, so he was very different from his father. So, he said, as long as you're educated, as long as you're making positive choices, if you're honest with me, I'm going to love you. So, I knew for my father there was not going to be a rigid rejection. My father is just too wise and too important a church figure uh, as a church leader to be able to do that. And so that began a journey. So I came out to my parents right before I headed off to college. And we uh, remember I sat them down and I said, okay, I'm going to tell you something. On one condition, I'm not going to tell you if you don't agree to my condition. The one condition is you can never bring up this subject or ask me about it ever again. I was like, Dad, Mom, do you agree? So after some hee-hawing around and stuff, they said, yeah, we agree. So then I said, well, I'm gay, and I, uh, and I don't know what I'm going to do about it yet. Uh, you know, I just, I just need you to know, but I have to control the message and who I'm going to tell and what kind of situation we're going to get into. And as a result of that, then, you know, I dashed off to college. And uh, for about a year and a half, we didn't talk about it at all. I mean, I told them. I wanted them to adjust to it. I wasn't telling all my other family members. Uh, but then all within three years, that had all changed. So then I, uh, I ended up taking a job for the Mennonite Church during this coming out years. They had a ministry to their uh, students and young adults. And they had a publication. And the Mennonites were made up of two different denominations. There were basically the old Mennonites, which came over here at the invitation of William Penn from Central Europe, and then there were the new Mennonites who in Europe had migrated to Russia and then came over at, after the Bolshevik Revolution, and they settled in the Central Plains like Newton, Kansas, and so there were the General Conference Mennonites and the old Mennonites, and together they formed uh, an organization that would minister to the people who had left the church. So we had a lot of our Mennonites at universities and in college campuses and, you know, in anti-war activities because Mennonites were always pacifists. And uh, this ministry was to minister to all of those folks, and they selected me to edit their magazine that was published monthly. So this was like a magazine, sort of like Newsweek, and we would collect articles from thinkers and writers, and we would publish this. And I was the editor while I was living in Washington, D.C. So this is paid for 50% by the General Conference Mennonites, 50% by the Old Mennonites. So my salary was coming from these two different denominations. Well, that was the year I was coming out. <laughs> and somehow having a gay employee working for the Mennonite Church just didn't work out very well. But because they didn't want to fire you for being gay, they just cut off funding and they shut the magazine down. So I still remember... The, them delivering that message and we sort of knew what the real reason was and the one church leader who had um, had cut off the funding was a young conservative righteous 
person who, at the same time that he was cutting off my funding, he was forcing me to kneel with him and putting his arms around me and praying for my soul and firing me at the same time. And I still never, I mean, I always remember that as being one of those times where, where does abuse of power really come from? When is somebody who's telling you, you know, they're firing you, but they still love you, and they want your soul to be saved because you're gay? It was the weirdest kind of experience. So after that, um, the Mennonite Church decided they were going to kick me out. So I left the church at that point, and I really haven't looked back from a faith perspective. And from that point on, then I was just out in my work life and very active in the community. Okay. Um, are you married? Do you have any children or grandchildren? My partner is Steve Dinesenny, and we have been together for, uh, we're coming up on our 29th anniversary this summer. Oh, so <laughs> when Pennsylvania marriage became legal, uh, up to that point we had decided uh, that we were just going to wait until it was legal in PA and not worry about trying to transfer a license in. So last summer, uh, you know, the, the, the courts basically said, okay, it's going to be legal in PA. And we were number two at the courthouse. We let somebody go in front of us. But we raced down there. As soon as they told us in Lancaster that you were going to be able to get married, we went down. We got our application together. So we applied for an application on the first day. It was legal in Pennsylvania. But then it took us about a month to plan what we wanted to do. I didn't want to spend a lot of money because we had had a big 25th anniversary party about three years beforehand and invited hundreds of friends. And, you know, I spent the wedding money on our 25th anniversary, so I didn't have to then plan a wedding. So Steve and I, because he was a guidance counselor and he was a special ed teacher in the public schools, he always had children that he was dealing with all day long, every day. And uh, he said, I just really don't want to come home and have to deal with that. So we made a choice at that point to uh, probably not adopt or bring a child into this world. So, no children. Okay. Um, that son is causing a problem. You just need to tell me. I'm going to put it right behind the bar so I can look at you without having to squint, but if the, if the light is weird, okay. please make for sure that no problem. Thank you, you. tell me. Do you have any military background? I do not. Yeah, Mennonites were basically pacifists, so we, uh, we, uh, we did a conscientious objector status. But I'm at the age, at 57 years old, that I'm right between the Vietnam War having to register for the draft and when they made everybody register again, and there was about four windows in there, four years in there, where they don't even have my number. So, no, I never served. Okay. Uh, so, can you talk to me when, uh, about when you first started, got started in um, LGBT activism in Central Pennsylvania? Well, I moved back here when I was 28, and prior to that I was just uh, out to family and friends and sort of out in the community. And um, I'd say I probably was more active uh, initially because of HIV. And there was just so much discrimination and so much fear and so much loathing that happened when people, uh, you know, either tested positive with HIV or they came sick and they were dying. And so we were organizing groups to help take care of people who were sick, and this would have been like in the early 80s, uh, 84, 85. Prior to that, I would have gone to a bunch of gay pride parties. You know, we used to rent ski round top and hire a bunch of bands. We used to, oh, then we'd go to a gay pride in New York every year. We would do things in Philadelphia, but I wasn't uh, particularly active except in the Mennonite Church. So in the Mennonite Church, we had an organization called the Brethren Council for Mennonite Concerns. It was founded in 1972, and then I served on its uh, national board. And at that point, we were organizing groups to go to the church conferences, and we would basically speak out to the church who was still debating this issue of sexuality. And, you know, at that point, they were trying to make a decision what to do about this, and they decided to go conservative for like 20 years, so they basically shut us down. But at that point, we were still in dialogue. And I would go to these church conferences, a youth, you know, a youth person, and we'd just run around and prance. You know, we were young gay guys who were trying to tell the church they should accept us and love us. And... Uh, so I did the church thing, then I did the, the Lancaster AIDS Project, the formation of that, the ministering to other people and, and, and the issues around that. 
And then there was a group of us here in central Pennsylvania who decided we needed to sort of take control of both the education and the political persuasion issues. And so uh, there was a group of us in Harrisburg that formed who through the first sort of uh, joint public and private gay pride events. And so I would have worked on those steering committees and done a variety of activities around that. I would have done a lot of fundraising in the early days because um, the early vestiges of the LGBT movement were uh, either in the aid service organizations or they were over at Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood gave us space in their building to be able to have all of our meetings and organizing. Uh, in the early days, there were a number of activities you could participate in. We had, a, we had a, a, a hotline, and people were able to call the hotline. So if you were thinking of killing yourself, you needed someone to talk to. There was a parents group. There was a parent support group because a lot of, particularly in my case, it was guys. They would end up coming out, but it was after they were married. I mean, these were the days when everybody got married because that was what you do. And so uh, my most intense activities around gay civil rights would have been as an activist would have been in planning those gay pride events in Harrisburg and Lancaster. Um, once I became more successful in business, then I was much more the quiet influencer that helped organizations be able to make for sure that they uh, would offer LGBT benefits, for instance. In my company, we were pioneers. We had to teach the insurance company what that was all about because we were a fairly large company at that point, and we were able to, through self-insurance, be able to offer domestic partner benefits. And uh, then in the organizations I worked with, every organization I've worked with, I made for sure that they were willing to change and be able to offer domestic partner benefits. So the last one, the most, most sort of stuck in the way, was uh, Lancaster General Hospital. And it's called Lancaster General Health now. And I'm actually their incoming board chairman. But in 2006, finally, we got domestic partner coverage for everybody. And, uh, you know, we forget what those days are like, but basically if you were in a partnered relationship and you got sick with HIV or you were disabled or you retired, you couldn't get benefits. And you had to each basically have your own benefit tree. And everybody else who was married got to share those things. So you could come on my health plan and, you know, you could get my Social Security. And before gay marriage, this was a big issue. And conservative organizations that either had faith-based roots would routinely just deny benefits unless they had somebody progressive who went to their HR departments and said, we're going to change how this works. We're at, we may not be able to have marriage, but at least we're going to be able to have the benefits that come with uh, being in a partner relationship. Right, and you're that person. <laughs> I was. I played a role in that, yes. <laughs> um, could you speak more about the Lancaster AIDS Project and um, HIV in Central Pennsylvania? Oh, let's see. I want to reflect on that a little bit. So, I'm trying to think, 85. First heard the words HIV, I believe, in 85. Had my first friend tell me he was HIV positive in 85. There was no treatment at that point. Um, might have been 84 because we started Isaacs in 1983. And I hired several people who worked for me who were HIV positive and. I was just, everybody was like, what are we going to do about this? You know, it's a death sentence and we, we aren't organized. And so there were a number of activists in about 1985 who came together and wanted to form an organization where they could go out and, like the gay men's health crisis in New York, they wanted to take care of the people in our community because you have to understand how bad it was. Families wouldn't want you there. There wasn't knowledge whether or not it could be infected by blood and, and, and body fluids. There was a real fear that if you hugged somebody and kissed somebody or did any of those kind of activities that you were going to get infected. So people really got isolated. And so when someone got sick, they had nobody but their friends to take care of them. And so there was a real compelling need to take care of people and to raise money to help provide that support structure. Then there was more the political thing of how do we stop the spread of HIV, you know, and we have to tell people they've got to start wearing condoms and, you know, stop having oral sex and, you know, they've got to be using dental dams and, you know, a needles exchange. You know, a lot of the a lot of folks were IV users back then, just like heroin today is really big. There were a lot of people back in those days that were doing smack. And, you know, it, but not only gay people but others, and it was just there, and we had to come together. So. In the early days of HIV, United Way wanted nothing to do with us. They wouldn't fund us. We were pretty desperate. 
But I had office space in my company, and I basically said to them, as we formed the initial group, you can have the office space and let's set up an organization. Let's actually go file as a nonprofit status, because that way we can apply for grants, and that way we can funnel money into the organization, and then we set up committees to take care of different pieces of it. Some were on prevention, some were on taking care of people who are sick, and then some were on much more the political activism who could do other things. So I was the board chair there, I believe, for about three years, and we had a whole host of people that died. I mean, I've been at the bedside of at least a dozen people when they took their last breath, and it'll shape you for the rest of your life. It just burns right through you. Because there are people your age and my age, you know, people in their 20s, and, you know, you just die for having sex. And if you don't know better, it's very, very sad. So, um... I would say there was probably about six or eight years between 1984 and 1990 that that was probably the, pretty much the focus of at least the men in the community. But most of the lesbians I knew, they came together and joined us. It was a time when we had to take care of our own rather than rely on other people to take care of us. You know, until the medical science got to the place that you could have physicians and others in the community who said, you know, this isn't that big a deal. If you prevent it, you know, if you have safe sex, as an example, you're, you're not going to get HIV. And then, you know, by the, by the early 90s, you know, they at least came up with stuff that slowed the disease down. And, you know, fast forward to 2000, and they had retrovirals, and people were then living for a long period of time after that. But it was all about your friends being infected with HIV. And so much of the early LGBT movement was how to organize, how to do direct action, and how to try and change a society's attitude about this disease. And tell, I will tell you, I mean, people were a lot more scared about HIV than they were about, you know, having some queers live on the block or, you know, <laughs> do something in the neighborhood. So. How is, um, how is that and your LGBT identity um, influenced other aspects of your life, whether it's social or political or religious or civil, um, even spiritual? Uh, we have these formative years between adolescence and when we basically have sort of settled into a career and raising a family that, that are the very formative years. And these really formed years for me. I mean, it's put me in a situation where I would say, you know, within my estate planning right now, LGBT rights and uh, gay marriage are the highest priority for me. I, uh, I'm thinking of changing that now that gay marriage is here. You know, I have other people that are suffering in a lot of other ways. And it's not just LGBT rights and, and that kind of thing. But there was a time when I didn't think we would necessarily get there because the, the, the opponents of, of gay marriage were very strong. And in the early days, we wanted to stop job discrimination, we wanted to stop housing discrimination, and we thought that was enough. If we could get people to just live their lives and have the freedom and flexibility not to worry about being fired for being gay. And... Uh, you know, I never, in fact, in the early days, of, I remember going to some of the activist meetings in Philadelphia and places like that, and people would say, oh, if we could go for gay marriage. You know, there was this bodybuilder couple, I can't remember what their name was, but they were like, you know, had been on People magazine, and they'd sort of been stars in the community and stuff, and they were like, oh, we should, we should pro, pro gay marriage. And I remember being one of those guys that said, gay marriage, no way, because that's way too in front of where we are right now. We need to start with non-discrimination. We need to handle that first. And if I know, knew now what I knew then, I would have said gay marriage, yes, because it solves so many problems and so many issues that basically make this issue almost go away for a lot of people because it brings the conversation into the community conversation and all of a sudden when you have the President of the United States talking about gay people and talking about gay marriage and you have this ba basically being, I, I can be out to anybody now without ever, I, I talk about my husband now all the time. And it's funny, you know, almost 30 years after we got together to be able to refer to him as my husband is really hard because I'll be dealing with a contractor in here who's working on this cabin and I'll say my husband doesn't like this where in the old days I'd either said my partner I'd have said my spouse you know and uh, I just people just don't even swallow hard anymore they just sort of look away and they smile and I think people like it I think they like I think they like to hear that I've got a husband I do I like it <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> Um, are there any other important events or turning points in your life that we haven't discussed? Oh, let me think here a little bit. 
the same thing I wanted to say. I, I don't. I, I, you know, to me, I've been around long enough to make some observations. You know, it used to be that we would gather in these very special places. You know, I remember the very first time I walked into a gay bar. It was out in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I was at a church camp out there in the Laurel Highlands. And somebody said, oh, there's this little gay bar in Greensburg, Pennsylvania called the Safari Lounge. And I was so nervous. I mean, I just did not want to walk in there at all. And I went in, and of course I went up and they had some jukeball, I mean, they had some pinball machines, and some guy came up and like stood behind me on the pinball machine. I was like freaking out. Uh, and, but we used to have these very special gathering places called gay bars. And, you know, there are some days I, lo I uh, mourn the loss of that real close sense of community. Because today, gay rights have more moved mainstream and like in Lancaster for now we probably have five bars that are gay owned but they all have mixed people so it's not like an exclusive so now you go into these bars and you meet all these guys and you don't know whether they're gay or not you meet all these young people who come out to a jazz club I mean I don't know if you've ever been like to the Belvedere in Lancaster but it's it's not gay but it's where everybody goes that wants to be at a cool place and uh, to me, that means I think the movement has been successful, but it has somewhat separated us. So, um, I don't know. Many of my friends have created a hardcore gay identity where their friends are pretty exclusively gay. They go on gay cruises. They do vacations with gay people and stuff. For me, I was much more uh, wanting to take the part of me that was gay and say, this isn't that big a deal. I have all these other interests. I have all these other issues and community projects I like to work on. And being gay is just no different than anybody else. And so I think, I think it's pretty exciting to say, okay, that goal of mine, which was to not have this be so important in all my interactions, has actually come true. And I'm really delighted that we've made that much progress in my lifetime. So. Well, on that, you've mentioned some of the changes that you've already seen, like, Gay marriage in Pennsylvania, um, but what challenges remain? I think that the ch the political challenge was will still be here for another twenty years, uh, but I think most of the challenges that are here today have to deal with individual family units and the struggles that individuals have when they are unable to accept that their child may not be the perfect you know, Barbie doll or the perfect, you know, Bruce that they want him to be, you know. Uh, I. So for me today, it's the issue of young people and those individual family units that are not accepting where I think that we need to pay a lot of attention. And I think society is, you know, the, the It'll Get Better campaign that they did for gay youth and others. I think those are the things that are really important because while on this global issue, we appear to have made a lot of progress where we become part of the conversation and those of us who have a lot of self-confidence and have parents who love us have no issues whatsoever with being gay. We can move right through it. What you don't have though is these families. It might be a, a family that uh, is from Guatemala that's never ever even knew what it was and but they just know they don't want their son to be that way because they have words for that in Guatemala. You know, or it might be a family in the hillbillies of West Virginia where, you know, they, they just you know, they still use the word, the F word all the time, and they call everybody out, and you get sort of isolated. And young people, I think, who feel different, and then the family culture that they grew up in need to make for sure that we have, that they know that there are alternative places that they can go for support, particularly when the parents are totally rejecting and kicking these kids out. Um, you might know more from your class than what I know today, but you see reading these studies of the number of people that are uh, in homeless and uh, in New York and, and places like that, but a lot of these young gay people end up getting kicked out of their homes and they have nowhere to go except to hit the street somewhere. And, uh, and that's, that's really sad to me. So I have a lot of interest in trying to help young people come to the sense of awareness and self-awareness and self-acceptance that I've been able to have. And that is a powerful thing because 
when you're not separated, like your faith over here and your sexuality over here, or your family here and your belief system over here, when you can bring those together, it really helps create a sense of who you are that you can basically accomplish what you want to do. Uh, I find it fascinating as I watch the transgendered movement happen. I mean, in the early days, you know, we had fights at the pride, uh, the, the gay pride parties that we would plan, of what roles the drag queens could have. Because we weren't really talking transgender 25 years ago, it was all the drag queens, and what did the drag queens want to do? And for some of them, for some people on the planning committee to have the drag queens do all these shows and do all this limb syncing and all these outrageous costumes was fun, and we could laugh at ourselves. And for other gay people, this was just so outrageous. This is like these are going to offend other people. So if we're trying to get civil rights, why do we want to put our most offensive people out front? Well, underlying all that is this, is, is this gender challenged issue that many gay people have and then to understand what's different about it from gay people. And so I'm still learning today as we hear these stories of people who are transgendered. And initially I thought it was pretty straightforward, you know, some men are born to think they're girls, some girls are born to think they're men, and for those that want to transition it's okay, but you know, this idea that we have a gender identity that's separate from our sexual identity. Because some people who have a gender identity don't necessarily automatically want the other gender than what they were born with, sometimes some want their same gender. And so it's two different things, and that's been a real growth opportunity for me in today's society. So I think we probably have more room to grow in that area as well. Okay. Um, have we missed anything? Is there anything else you want to state for the record? Anything I didn't ask? No, but I'm glad you're doing this project. Me too. No, seriously, <laughs> I think this is a... It's a good thing, and I'm happy for you. Thank you. Um, I guess my last question is just that, do you know of any others that you think we should um, contact and interview? Well, I know there's a group of us in Lancaster who do, used to do some of the planning who are going to go together, and that was one of my suggestions to the leaders of this LGBT project, is that when you get people together, it really helps trigger memories, and then the stories get better. Because you'll find, you know, 25 years from now, you will uh, forget a lot about what you did right now. And so I need people to help me trigger some memories to tell those stories. But I did have fun today going back through my old boxes and going through my library and pulling a bunch of stuff out. And uh, in fact, I'm going to make a PDF of something and send it. I could even send it to you. But in 1981, in our Brother Mennonite gay rights group called the Brother Mennonite Council for Gay and Lesbian Concerns, I got my dad to write a column about what it was like to have me come out to him. I got my sister to write a column about what that meant, and then I wrote a column, and here were three people in the same family. Well, that was in 1981, that was almost unheard of, and we published our story, and I hadn't read that thing forever. Funny thing is, my dad, he's 96 years old, and he wrote a letter to his beloved Mennonite church about nine months ago, and that darn letter went viral. I mean, as a result, my wedding was actually on. <laughs> it was on. Uh, we were in People magazine, and you would have read it in Viral magazine and BuzzFeed. And my dad's letter went uh, all this, and it was called a letter to my beloved Mennonite Church. And Dad has become a uh, very much a soldier for gay wedding, and he wants our Mennonite Church to change and accept people. So what I did was I read his column in 1981 where he wasn't really in favor of gay rights, but he loved his son, and that was the overdominant thing, to where he is today at 96, 97, and he is this guy that everybody in the Mennonite church says, oh, he's our Moses, because he's telling the church we really have to change, and because his letter went viral on, on our publication here, it got like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of views and all these thousands of shares, and it's really cool. Uh, to have him as my father and to have him come to where I was and I'm just really happy about that. That's amazing. It is. So, I can send you the link to that if you're interested. Absolutely. Do you story. have anything you'd um, like to show us? Any photo albums or books or anything with you today? Um, you mean just to do it on camera or just to just show you afterward? Either. Whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> I did have a stack of books over there. I have an early quilt project book and a bunch of others, but I don't think it's necessary to show those on camera okay. sometime. If somebody's interested at a later point and I'm still available and you're taking a look at this, feel free to contact me. I'll bring you to my library. But 
there was a time when our one of our gathering places was the gay bookstore and then you know mainstream publications wouldn't publish gay authors so a lot of us had stories to tell whether it was the coming out stories that were like that front runner that i read or whether it was um, um, uh, the early aid stories i mean there was just so much pain and anguish going on and a lot of those writers were writing about that experience of what it was like to be young and dying and and taking care of people that were your friends and lovers and watching them die and seeing the government not respond to that. So I have this whole library of books that I just bought everything I could and read in those early days. And now it's sitting at my other house in you know all these shelves and I was just looking at all those books and I was like, oh my God, there was a lot of history here in the last 30 years. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much. I think that's all we have.